Live from the Bronx, we are still the podcast that celebrates Bronx creatives and change makers, and I'm your boy KB. Here, what's going on, beautiful people? It is your boy Jay. And on today's episode, we have a very special guest, right? I like to think of myself as a really smart dude. Jay likes to think of himself as a really smart dude. We like to hang out with really smart people. But today, we literally have a scientist in our midst. So today, we're going to be kicking it with the a senior associate scientist at Pfizer, uh, someone that I could call a friend, someone who I've known for years. Her name is Alexi Palmer, and she was on the team that brought together the uh, that brought out the Pfizer um, vaccine. So we're gonna get to kick it with Alexi. So Alexi, how you doing, homie? Hey, hi everyone. I'm good. Excited to be here. So I'm excited that you are here because let's let's get this vaccine talk going. So. A lot of people have feelings about the vaccine. Should I get it? Should I not get it? Right. So we're going to dive into all of that. But one of the reasons why I think it's really powerful that you're here is because it's it's dope to see black women in science, black women scientists. And we don't see enough of that. So Jay and I thought it would be really dope to kick in with you, learn about who you are, your connection to the Bronx, your connection to science, and also talk about that vaccine talk. So. I guess one of the things that we like to talk to our guests about first, before we even jump into anything, we want to get to know who you are. So we have a, a question that we like to start with. Who are you? How do you identify? We like it vague on purpose. So whatever identities you, you take on and you connect to, please uh, feel free to kind of throw that out there. Okay, so I'm Alexi. I um, identify as she, her. Um, and um, yeah. I guess I'm Alexia. I'm from the Bronx, born and raised. Um, I've I've done school in the Bronx. I've done community outreach. I have my church is right here up the block from the Bronx. So definitely based here in the Bronx. When when you say here in the Bronx, where are we talking about? Like what neighborhood? Where'd you uh, grow okay. up? Where'd you uh, go to school? T talk to us about all of that. We want to learn about your journey. Okay. So I went to school. So my journey started pre pre-K at SPJ. Um, stands for St. Philip and James uh, School. So it came, went from pre-K to eighth grade, um, right there on Boston Road. For those of you who know where Boston, Boston is. Boston Road. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. More uh, fire, more fire. So many of us who come from SPJ, to be honest. Um, even now, I still see people and I'm like, hey, like people still remember me and I remember them from SPJ. Um, so that's where I did a bulk of my school. I went to high school at Cathedral um, High School, so all girls Catholic school. Oh, so side note, uh, St. Philip and James is also Catholic school as well. Um, so yeah, uh, did high school at uh, Cathedral High School, all girls Catholic school. That was actually Manhattan, 59th Street. A couple of us did come from the Bronx too, so you know how long that journey was to go to school every morning <laughs> and come back home. Um, and then I went off to college, which was in Fairleigh Dickinson University. That is in New Jersey, Madison, New Jersey. Did four years there. That's when I, so I studied biology. So I have my bachelor's degree in biology with a concentration in chemistry from there. Um, my journey in science really started when, well, I guess I fell in love with science um, in seventh grade, all due to my teacher. At St. Philip and James, Mr. Rosado. <laughs> Shout, Shout out, out to Mr. Rosado. <laughs> um, the way he just explained it, it just flowed. He was, it was really good. It was so interesting to me. And um, in those grades, like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, like science is pretty, pretty vague. Like you, you kind of like um study all aspects of it, not really specific to anything really. Um, but I just really fell in love with just knowing that, you know, like something can be made out of nothing, um, just the different areas of biology. Now in my adult years, I've specialized in like health and um, more that aspect of it, but it definitely all stemmed from my love for biology though. Can, can you, let's talk about that a little bit, right? Cause a lot of times I know, I know me and my friends at least like when it came to science, it was, it was just like, to your point in middle school, science was just science. It was like general. Mm -hmm. And we knew when we got to high school, we needed to study science to pass the regents, right? Mm -hmm. There was no connection <laughs> to like life for us in terms of science. It was like, yeah, you need to know this, but because 
you need to be able to pass this regions at the end of the year, right? So mm-hmm. you start off with living environment, earth science, and all these different types of sciences, but no one ever made it really that interesting for us or like connected it to real world, even though science is such a big part of human life, right? So what exactly. was that what was that like for you? Like why was it that this teacher was able to get your attention and really um engage in conversations around science with you? Like I think that that we need to talk about that because many of us don't think about science as a career path, right? But there's something about the way the teacher taught that to you and, and spoke to you about it that resonated with you. So what, what was that like? Yeah, so um, that's what he did. As you stated, like science is super vague, like um, especially during those times, you're really just focused on passing your regents or passing that exam that you have to take. So you study it just to study it, which I've done the same, right? We've all done that. But what he did for us, he made it, he connected it to rural worlds for us. So that was super dope. Like he, he was, so he still is actually a very like fun person and he, he, you know, very interactive. So he made it interactive for us. And I guess that's what it was for me. It was just interactive and making me understand or connecting it to my real world, right? Because a lot of things in the classroom, unfortunately, some kids will tune out or some things you you just do to do, but because it's not connected to your everyday, you don't connect with it. So what he did was connected to our everyday. So we were, what I was able to connect with it. I'm sure some people still like, don't like science and I'm sure he didn't connect with everyone in the class, but I know that was definitely something for me on him connecting it. And it's exactly what you said. You have your basics, like your living environment, your basic chemistry, your basic subjects like that. Um, also in high school, um, I went to a high school specifically that had like a health program that, had, so I was, I, I got accepted into that health program at that school and um, I was able to go into the hospital setting. So that's when it kind of changed for me. It was like, okay, biology is really cool. Like learning that you know, like these little bacteria or these little things could like cause such a huge issue, right? Too, right? Like a little bacteria could make you sick for days or a little virus, <laughs> it could make you sick for days. Um, so that was interesting. But on the health aspect, I actually got to go to the hospital. Um, in this program, we did an internship. So you got accepted into internship, which I did. And then um, you got to go to the hospital every Friday. So instead of going to class, we went to the hospital. And I happened to go to the hospital right here in the Bronx, Montefiore Hospital, right there on Lake, I don't know, yeah, the Moses Division. Um, so shout out to the Moses uh, Montefiore team. Um, so that's where I learned, like that's when it was the hospital setting. And that's when I guess I um decided yeah this this is the aspect of biology that I like like the health aspect um helping people and um you know really getting to that one-on-one the patients which funny enough my career did not turn out that way but still helping people indirectly indirectly and directly you're, you're saving the world we're gonna yeah. we're gonna get there but you're saving the world so it sounds like your your journey from even from like sixth, seventh grade, middle school, it sounds sounds like you knew you wanted to do science. And mm-hmm. it sounds like that's kind of been a thread all the way through. So one of the things that we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna talk about role models and and uh, and black women in science, but did you have it? Did you have any? Did you see other people that looked like you? Was there ever other people who like, I can look to this woman because I wanna be like her? Or was it you kind of creating your own? So it was a little bit of both. I will say that because no, I did not have like a black woman at the time that I was super focused on, like who I guess for conversation, just like a, like someone famous or someone like everyone knew about. I, my role model, to be honest, was right here in my household, which is my mother. She um, she's like a superwoman. Like she <laughs> she came from my parents are Jamaican so they came from Jamaica and she just kind of knew what she wanted and she went for that so she's a she's actually well she actually now has her doctorate but she's a nurse practitioner um so I just saw her right just come up go to school she went to nursing school she got her master's and she got doctorate but while she was in nursing school and just she would come home with her stories which were super interesting about what she was doing in school and stuff and um another so that that's really who was my role model and just hearing in the household like you know like so this is this is a thing but like a lot of Caribbean households it's like you're either a doctor or a nurse you're not like no one talks about being a scientist which is I made it my mission to uh do all these talks really let little girls know and like little boys know too like you can be a scientist that's a thing you can be in science and there's so many diverse 
avenues in science. Like people don't talk about that. You can be a technician like we have right now. Uh, I know someone who works at Pfizer, but he works with the animals. So he's like a, like an animal technician, but he works with the animals. Um, but he still works at Pfizer, right? So it's just so many different avenues out there versus just besides like a doctor or nurse, or you can still be a doctor or a nurse. We have many clinical sites that Pfizer does, like uh, associates with. When we do our clinical studies, you could be a nurse there, you could be a doctor there. So there's so many different ways um, that you could get into science. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a nurse or a doctor. Um, I am the first scientist in my family. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's something different. Um, it took them some time to get used to the fact that I will not be a doctor or a nurse, that I'm going to be a scientist, and this is my career. Um, so I, I, do, I do want everyone to understand that there's so many different, uh, biology is like a huge umbrella. Underneath that, you have so many different um, avenues of education, right? You can study health, you can study public health, you could do hospital administration. There's so many different things underneath that one umbrella. Then underneath there, you have so many different careers that open so many different careers for you. You can study chemistry. I can't believe I have a minor in chemistry because chemistry was not it for me, but um, I I did it and I did well. And I ended up giving him, uh, you know, I did, I did good in the class and I was like, wow, once again, like the, just the teaching aspect and teachers really do it for you. So that's a huge thing too. So shout out to all the teachers out there that are really trying to get their good, good, te good teachers. We shout yeah. out the good teachers, <laughs> the good teachers that are really trying to, you know, help their students and encourage your students. It's, it's not an easy job, but trust me, like I still remember my seventh grade teacher. So whoever's teaching seventh grade out there, do your best because someone will remember you and talk about you in the future. You heard? No, that's big. That's so big. I just want to touch on something really quickly, right? As you were talking about watching your mom and her being your role model and going into nursing and getting all her degrees, like that's super dope, right? Talk to me a little bit about like watching her study, right? And even your experience, right? Like how did that help you? Not only bring this up because I remember uh, my friends who were on the pre-med track and they used to be buried in textbooks all day and I never understood I'm like yeah that mm, that's not a thing I could do now I don't know if that's everyone's experience right because I never I never went into science or the sciences or the medical field or anything like that but I would imagine it's a rigorous like process right and so what was it like for you to watch her study and would you pick up did you pick up on anything from watching her that helped you along in with your studies so my mom, watching her, I was pretty young um, when she started her school journey, like her college career. Um, but unfortunately, she had to work and go to school. So she worked full time and was school full time. So I barely saw my mom, to be honest, during that time. And when I did see her, she was up late studying um, books open, even now, like, I guess she got her doctorate in my later years. So uh, just seeing that she, once again, still working full time and doing school full time. And she just, her work, I think she works very hard. So I can honestly say like, she'll take that time, good time management, um, you know, and I can say me seeing her do that, um, just managing her time, she knew what was priority. So if she has somewhere to go, something to do, she did her work beforehand or she just chose what was priority in that moment. Um, so for me doing my master's and my doctorate, uh, I kind of picked up the same momentum to be honest. I, I work full-time throughout my master's and I work full-time throughout my doctorate as well. So, well, working now throughout it. So it really is time management. It's managing your time, understanding what's priority. I try to do my assignments ahead of time as best as I can so that I'm not um, behind. It's not a good feeling when you have projects due at work and projects due for school. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I can honestly say it just be just a hard worker. Um, I actually was done with school once I finished my master's. I was over it. I was like, okay, well, that's it. Um, and my mother encouraged me to go back and do my doctorate. Um, I started last year. So like in the midst of COVID, I decided, okay, well, let's just apply. Let's see what's out there. And then I got accepted to all the schools I applied for. So I took that from a sign. I, I, I love that, that humble <laughs> brag. I got into all the schools I applied for. <laughs> Dr. Palmer on the way. <laughs> so I took it as a sign, like maybe I should do this. So um, I started and I'm, after this summer, I'll finish my first year. When I um, 
knew that I was going to start working at Pfizer in my head I was like well I'm going to be there with a bunch of like older people and I'm probably going to be like the only black girl probably the only like uh one who's from the Bronx who's not like you know like so I Alexa was, you like, can say it say <laughs> you can say what you're thinking <laughs> okay, I do call myself a nerd because I do nerd out about certain things that's fine but I am I guess like a cool nerd so um I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to go in and walk to. I can't say that, at least in the beginning, Pfizer had a lot of young people. I was so surprised. I was like, wow, I walked in and like, I met like three people from the Bronx. Um, so, you know, it was, it was different. I will say in my group though, like, so we're all spread about different groups. In the beginning, most of us kind of sit in the same area until you get, like, you move up and stuff. So, um, but specifically group wise, I was the only black girl in my group when I first started um, at Pfizer. Um, and there was another black guy in my group, but um, he wasn't from the Bronx, I should say. And um, <laughs> yeah, so I was, so when I first started my job, I used, to, I used to wear makeup every day. I mean, that's gone now, I do not, but I used to wear makeup every day. I just come, you know. Um, and as you said, like you could, you know, when you're from the Bronx, like it don't, it doesn't leave you, uh, no matter what environment you're in. So I just, you know, carried that with me, and everybody was just like, um, so uh, I like to crack jokes. I'm a very fun person, so that's what I do. I make people, I try to make people feel comfortable, like when they're in my environment, at least. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of shock for the people. I'm not gonna lie. Um, but they got, you know, they got acclimated, like it was fine. <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was definitely a shock because I can't actually say that I experienced like my first bout of, I guess you could say sexism, racism in my adult years. I got to find that 22 and that's the first time. And I guess that's due to even, I mean, in college it was there, but it's not as, it was not as in your face and direct, um, this was very direct and it's been happening, but I can honestly say like I've made it my mission since I've gotten there um, and shout out to Plaza for giving me opportunities to even, I've, I was uh, part of hiring for a big project that we did. And I guess I was part of hiring about 50 new colleagues and um, a good portion of them were um, black. So I was, I, I got two black girls from my own group um, shout out to them. <laughs> and, uh, well, three, I guess, if you, yeah, three. And um, it was, you know, it's just diverse. I got some more diverse people in. And um, I just, I just wanted to see that, you know, we can make a small change. Granted, um, I try my best. So I'm actually on, so we have a thing at our job at Pfizer called Colleague Resource Group. So it is, the acronym we use for that is a CRG. So um, there is, there was one for the Black community at other sites, but there was none at our site. And it bothered me for a long time because I'm like, you know, like we, we should all get together. We should all know each other, like who's here, what we're doing. Um, so I decided to step up and, and start it at our site. Um, the site lead for that now, it's been two years, a little over two years I've been doing this and I've gotten a great group together. I have a great e-board. Um, and we're trying every day, and this is aside from our day job. So we don't get paid for this. This is not something to get paid for, but this is just something that we're passionate about. And we try every day to bring initiatives. When everything happened with um, George Floyd, that was a huge thing for us. And um, we try to get some initiatives there um, just to change things up, you know, like this, this, this shouldn't, it's, it, you know, we've been dealing with these small things like here and there, like these small comments, these small attitudes and stuff, but really we no longer need to deal with these things. So we've been trying to change things up um, and save it some time. We got some pushback, but we're pushing back right back. Um, so I've, I've been trying and do this um, CRG and this is called Global Black Community at Pfizer. We've been talking to schools. We've been um, communicating externally. We've got so many different opportunities to really touch like young people, high school students. Um, I think we're about to talk to a church, a group of church uh, students um, sometime next week. And just letting them know like scientists, we, we all, like, we're all scientists. You can be one too. Like we all represent a different form. Like we're all, we're black, we're women. 
they come from different backgrounds. We're men, they're men, they come from different backgrounds. Um, but you know, you could you could do it too. You 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 look like us, and here we are. We're telling you that you could do it, and just making um, the community out there know that there's more to being a doctor and a nurse. And granted, doctors and nurses, shout out to them. You guys are amazing. You guys have contributed phenomenally to this whole like pandemic. Um, but there's people who work behind the scenes to do just just as much amazing work as well, and you can do that too. Cool. So a couple of things. One, you know, I work at a high school, right? When when are you guys gonna come talk to my kids? <laughs> add us to the list. We should definitely talk about <laughs> add, that. Add I, us, I love doing add it. Add us to the list. And um, the other thing you mentioned, uh, you mentioned after like everything that happened with George Floyd and and uh, that murder, right? What what was Pfizer's as a as a whole? So obviously y'all had your your um your organization that you kind of the chapter that you started. But what was Pfizer's response as a to what was happening? Being honest, I was I was actually not um, fond of how long it took for a response um, from Pfizer. Our CEO did put out a statement, but our CEO covers like the whole, the, our broad, like uh, the broader spectrum, right? So for our division, I just feel like it took way too long. Um, for our department, nothing. Um, and that was really disheartening. I remember like, okay, okay, so I can say this. Most of these things, they do affect me in a certain way, but when you hear about it so much, it's, you kind of become desensitized, right? To certain things. And um, at first it did not, I, I, I read the story about what happened to George Floyd, seen it all over the news, I followed it, everything. But it really hit me one day in the parking lot, I pulled up, I, would, I listened to a meeting, it was a meeting I was on, and I was like, wow, like, you know, do you care? Like, you, you understand that you have Black scientists who work here, you have Black people who work here, do you actually care what's happening? Um, and I actually started to cry, like, I was in my car crying, and I was in control of crying, and I could not understand, I was like, what's going on? <laughs> but I was, I guess I was so sad, because I was just like, your company represents so many different people. If something happens in one community, we need the same energy that something else happens in the other community. And that was what my problem was. It was just like, I need the same energy, guys. Like, this this is real. If we poll right now, we may not represent a large amount, but there is a significant amount of Black people here on campus at this point and who work for you. Show us some support, a statement, something. Are you okay? A small little segment in an email. Hey, are you guys okay? How are you doing? What can we do to help? That's all we wanted something to show that you actually feel what we're feeling or understand or um, even care about what we're going through in this moment in time. Some people were really affected. They couldn't even come to work and it felt as if it, it didn't matter, you know, so that was, that was my thing. So that's me being honest. So that's, that's honesty. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, that that's real, right? And I think that what you're sharing is so important for so many people to understand and hear because this is this is the same across all of our industries. Our industries, no matter if it's education, science, medical field, corporate America, tech, like it's predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more of us coming into these different spaces. But the reality is that like there's so much that we're dealing with and experiencing on a personal level, but also we're reminded every day of like the fact that, you know, you're black or brown, right? Like because of what's happening, we saw George Floyd and all police brutality um, that we've been experiencing. And so much so to the fact that you, you just said, right? Like I was desensitized. That's problematic, right? Like Kevin and I was just talking about a situation yesterday that I experienced that I'm like, yo, I haven't, I haven't witnessed this since I was in high school in my neighborhood. And at that time, I was so desensitized that I would be able to just kind of move on and, and, and go on with my life. Whereas, but that's what like, it is. Yeah. And where I spent so many years after that, really trying to understand how to process, really un under trying to understand how to grieve. Where yesterday when I witnessed what I witnessed, like I was like, yo, this is bothering me differently, right? Because I, I am now able to understand in a better place, like, you know, how traumatic <laughs> this stuff is right and so to your point right like you know un like that stuff hits you man and if it, it might not hit you today it's gonna hit you at some point um because you're you're consistently reminded of this man like white america just tells you like 
yo, no matter how dope you are, no matter how, how, how much work you're doing and how great you could be, like, you're still this, right? Like, and um, it's tough, man. And I think our industries need to do a better job of being um, being attentive and understanding, like, what's happening, right? Like, Kevin Lyles, um, he's in the music industry, right? And I just watched his interview on The Breakfast Club. And he started a company, his own, I guess, record label or whatever, management company. And he said that as part of his uh, company, he's he's offering therapy twice a week for all artists and staff members who are part of the company. And they can also take mental health days that don't count towards your like vacation. And like that, that is how you respond to what it is we're seeing. Right. So like, if I can't show up to work today, like, yo, I, I need you to understand this because I'm dealing with the trauma that, that like I'm consistently experiencing due to what's happening around the world. So I, I'm a firm believer of mental health days. Like if I was to ever start a company or um, have my own department someday, which, you know, shout out, I will have, um, I, I will do that. I think those are very important. And a, separate aside from what goes on in general in the Black community, sometimes we really do need a mental break. And that's just a thing. Why do I have to take a, like, that's not really me taking a sick day. I'm not sick. I just need a mental break. Um, a personal day. I understand some people might come say that that's a personal problem, but it's really not. I think it's something that everyone goes through and everyone can benefit from. And it's not a vacation because it's not a vacation when you're stressed out about something or have something going on. So I feel like mental health days should some somewhere be incorporated into these corporations at some point, especially when you have big corporations, even small, not taking away from small corporations, but a lot is happening. People have personal lives, people have things going on. Stresses at work are a huge thing. Um, people can get sick from how stressed they are at work. That is a real thing. Um, so I think mental health days are really important. And and yeah, that's that's lovely. Like that's really dope that he did that for his people. See the thing with Kevin Lau is though he's he's a black dude, so he has skin in the game. He gets it. Yeah. So many of these folks who are running these organizations don't have literally don't have skin in the game. So to them it's like, I, well, keep it keep it pushing. I was gonna say too oh sorry. No, nah, no, nah, you got it. No, um as much as we want to get these young people or these um, black people in these positions, right, um, in science or in these corporate positions, they're scared. They're scared because they're like, why come and, and experience these things? Why come and be mistreated? It doesn't make sense. So they're scared. That's another aspect. There's the aspect of not knowing, but there's the aspect of knowing, but not knowing what you're about to get into, not knowing how you're about to be treated, not knowing if your voice is going to be heard, not knowing if they're just going to see you as just a general worker and no one, just someone to spit out the work, come back again and spit out the work again the next day. They, you know, that's scary. And, and sometimes you just have to create your own lane. When I started my job at Pfizer, I was very like shy. I'm so shy, but um, very quiet, didn't speak out, anything like that. I had to really tap into that leadership ability that, <laughs> that um, is in there because if you don't, you will never be heard. Your ideas will never be um, put forth and you'll just be someone who works there and that's it. You also alluded to, uh, you talked about microaggressions before. You said as uh, as a woman, um, as a black woman, there were certain things that you had to that you had to maybe hear comments or, or things like that. Did you ever did you ever suffer from like, I guess, imposter syndrome? Did you ever feel like, yo, maybe I'm maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Maybe I'm not good enough. Or was that never part of your thought process? No, that is never part of my thought process. Um... If anything, I was like, thank God I'm here to help you guys out. Um, I remember one time in my group, this is my group was really much smaller than it is. And someone had said something, I, a few comments were said, and crazy enough, a few comments were said from someone who is not one of my closest friends, but I had to school them because I was not playing. So I remember I there, we had a map, a global map, and I had to say, I literally had to point out Africa, point out the different places in Africa, different Caribbean countries, um, and different places. And I really had like a real lesson in there um, in the lab that day. I'll never forget that day. And it was actually received pretty well. Like they were not, um, they didn't feel in type of way. They were just like, thank you. We were not informed. And I'm like, that's crazy. Cause I'm like, you guys are adults. Like what are you saying? Um, so 
a lot of it from what I can gather, at least in my small group, like I said, in my in the in the at that time um with the the people around me is just lack of knowledge, not knowing. So um I try my best just saying certain terms. I know I heard I've heard terms like like for instance, like this girl, she would be like, um, oh look, this this like she she's like you're kind. Like it was another black girl just walking in the in the, and she's like, Oh, you're kind. And I'm like, you know what's crazy? In a different time and place, that you would yeah, you could never get away with saying that. So I'm like, let me help you out. Uh you cannot say that. That's not okay. <laughs> you cannot walk around calling people your kind or you know, this and that, that's just not it. But she just didn't know. And in a different and situation, someone might have put hands on her. That's what I was trying <laughs> to say, but I couldn't say that to her, like, at that time, because that would scare her. But yes, <laughs> I was like, you can't say that. So um, for me, it was really, I did take a chunk of time trying to educate um, people and just, I had to do my own thing, right? I had to step up. I had to work harder than some um and show them that, you know, we're not here for games. Like, I'm just as smart as you. I'm just as hard working as you. Anything you give me, you want to throw me six projects while someone else has two, no problem. I'll do them and I'll do them well. Just to show you that, like, I'm I'm just at the same level as you. I got this job just as you got this job. So for a certain time, I did have to, like, really work hard, really show them that, like, I'm not just, like, a face here. I'm not here for demographics. Like, let's, like, I'm here to be a part of this community that's working and a part of this department that can, you know, do what we're set out to do. Um, so that was a big thing. But I remember, like, there was a comment said, and it that's when it hit me that this is really normal for them. Um, so I, when I got the job, I have an air piercing up here, and um, I guess someone from my group saw me the day of my interview. So I guess this was glistening across the hall or something. Um, and he goes, oh, I knew we were going to hire you, because he thought I had a bar, an industry piercing. So he's like, oh, we know you were perfect. I'm like, oh, not my resume, not my experience, but because I had it. A, a, a piercing that looked like it was it was a coal piercing that was one the second one was um I have a you know a, I guess a fun attitude but it's like fun where like I could go back and forth with people or whatever so we're going back and forth back and forth um now just to set up uh I guess set up the atmosphere this person I was going back and forth with he's Asian right so we're going back and forth right one of our head managers she's white she's a white woman and then she goes oh, um, this is what you asked for. This is what you wanted. She's saying this is Asian. Um, you wanted a sassy black girl. Now you have one in the group. Damn. No, but this was not even said like in an enclosure. This was said out in the open. Like we were all out in the open, like where people can walk past like an open area that we have at the company. It was normally said that's normal and in the moment I didn't know how to feel like I kind of just laughed it off and was just like <laughs> okay moving forward but like I went home and really like pondered on that and I was just like wow like <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know what to I, I couldn't process it I didn't know how to process it I didn't know what to think um but I couldn't I guess in my head like I said I hadn't experienced anything like that this was like me first starting there so it was really hard for me because I was just like was this a joke or was this like really how she felt or how they felt like was I just there to fill a quota like you guys didn't have a black girl so here we are or you, you didn't have someone sassy so here I am and it's like I'm not sassy first of all um it was just me going back and forth with him you know what I mean and we were both joking around so it's just like little stuff like that that um make me know that some people are truly unaware and some people are super comfortable in their environment and and what they're used to and it's not going to change unless someone comes and tries to change it and tries to like let them know that you can't say these things you can't do these things yeah i i just want to comment on this real quick right because they're they're unaware or choose not to pay attention right yeah. like that's that's the privilege right you don't you don't have to acknowledge the experiences of somebody else right and so that's what happens like and i just want to throw you your flowers right give you your flowers because 
what you just explained about just your experience in your career, right? And going there to just wanting to do good work, all of a sudden that turned into a whole goddamn project around race. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, the reality is, right, as as a, a Black woman, you you are not required to have them to teach them about this, but you're saying I'm, I'm going to choose to do that. Right. And, um, and I don't, I don't fault anybody who says I don't want to do that. Right. Like it's, it's, it's you a know, job. So I, yeah. I really don't fault them either. I mean, it's really like you go one way, you go the other. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing I want to, I want to say, right. Is uh, coming back to what you said about starting a chapter, right. Really focusing on diversity, getting more black women into, into your, into your field, right. Like all of that work is uh, something that you led and, and helped to spearhead, right? And it wasn't easy, right? But you're carving a path for other people who may not have to experience the exact same thing that you did. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that we got to celebrate, right? Like just all the, everything you've experienced, all the challenges, all the barriers, it's not even related to your actual work. And no. you being able to say like, yo, F it, I'm going to show y'all like who I am and we about to make some change and just, and just spearheading that change, man. I, I, I want to give you your flowers for that because it's, I know it's not easy as somebody who does a lot of systemic work around trauma and, 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 and equity work. Like I know, and I'm not a woman. So that adds another layer. Right. So I already don't like, so I just want to, I want to shout you out for, for all that you're doing right now to, to make a change at Pfizer. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was this vaccine. So I know right. at <laughs> Pfizer, you were on the, the, you are on the vaccine team. So, so oh. no, 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 please, please, please. So there's a lot of uh, energy around the vaccine and we just want to kind of get, get your thoughts. And we have a ton of questions that we think the listeners will really benefit from. So. Okay. So I just wanted to, so I, I still worked in my department. So what Pfizer did was kind of gather volunteers from different departments to work on the COVID vaccine because they knew that this was something that was going to happen very quickly. Um, they were not able to hire externally really for it because um, we needed to really get the ball rolling. So they kind of just asked different departments to come together to work on this. So I happened to get the opportunity to volunteer. So it was volunteer services. Um, and I worked in one of one of the groups that um, were used in like um, assay development or processing of um, COVID um, the, for the COVID vaccine, but basically uh, COVID processing really. Um, so I just want to clear that up. So <laughs> I didn't like really, so there's different things that people did. Um, yeah. Got you. So you were on one of the teams. One of the teams. One of the teams that helped mm-hmm. to roll this out. Perfect. So the other thing I heard you say just now is you still had your full-time job, right? This was in addition to the work that you were already doing. Yep. So so shout out to that. <laughs> so let's let's backtrack uh-huh. a little bit because when it comes to this vaccine stuff, everyone thinks they're a scientist. They're like, yeah, I was doing my research and the reason I'm not taking it is because I, I saw this, this. And... No, we have a real life <laughs> scientist here. So we're going to break it down with a real life scientist. First and foremost, what exactly is a vaccine? Okay, so now... This is something that you could find on Google and, <laughs> you know, any dictionary. So I'm literally going to read what I found and break it down from there. So vaccine, the word is a noun. It's a substance used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases. It can be prepared from a causative agent of a disease, its products, a synthetic substitute, and treated to act as an antigen without inducing the actual disease. So (laughs) breaking that down a a little bit. So basically what it's saying is that it's stimulating your antibodies. So in layman's terms, let's just call it this, a vaccine is something that whether out of the three that I just mentioned, whether it's a, a causative agent of the disease, a product of the disease, or a synthetic substitute of said disease, is really just to start an immune response within your body against that disease. So now when some people say, oh, um, they're giving us a disease. No, um, <laughs> we're not, that's not a thing. Um, there are some vaccines that use a live agent, right? Now, when it says live agent, that's just a piece of 
either a DNA or something live from that actual um, disease that is used in the vaccine, but that's just one component. That is not you getting the actual. So let's say we're using COVID as examples because that's a huge thing. We're not giving you COVID to stimulate antibodies for COVID. That's not a thing. It is just a piece of that. So for instance, for the COVID vaccine, which I apologize in advance if I cannot go into much detail, as we work at Pfizer and there's like legal legalities around that. So yeah, don't, talk- don't, don't get sued over our podcast. Tell, tell them what you can. <laughs> tell them what you can. So um, we have an mRNA vaccine. That's what our Pfizer's COVID vaccine is, an mRNA vaccine. Now, by the way, to- sorry, really quickly. By the way, I also got the Pfizer vaccine, um, okay. so so I'm happy that I'm I'm, I'm hearing this <laughs> firsthand from you. <laughs> so basically, what that is, so getting getting mRNA, you have to so backtrack. That has to be extracted from DNA. So that's DNA from the COVID, right? Like COVID. So at that point, it is not you getting COVID to stimulate uh, antibody response from COVID. That is just an aspect. So even if I went down and broke it down, so we have different facilities that work together for this whole COVID vaccine. So I can honestly say to you that we had um, uh, at least four to five different sites working on different um different um, aspects of it. So we had, let's say, we had a site in Andover, Massachusetts, right? They were working on turning the DNA into RNA. So I won't, and I guess I can't go into the super specifics of that, but once again, you could definitely do your research and you could literally research how to turn um, DNA into RNA. So that's like processing, right? So you do that. Then we had another site turning, that's adding, you're, there's, there's a fat. So there's four components, I believe, in the Pfizer vaccine. Please don't quote me in that. But none of these components will ha- harm you in any way. Um, and after you dis- uh, extract your RNA from your DNA, um, you add your fats, your fillings, and then that's it. And another site worked on that. So I say that to say different sites worked on different aspects to ensure quality control, to ensure that this is something safe. Now, a question that people say all the time is like, oh, like a vaccine, how can a vaccine come out in like six months or um, how many months? Understandably, but that's the thing. Normally, it does not. I agree. That's very fast. And to be honest, as a worker, I honestly felt the same way. I was like, that's super fast because we actually have a game that we play with students, high school, high school students that understand like what it takes for a vaccine to come out. And the game, the, the year expectancy is 20 years. So comparing 20 years to six months, I understand. And I don't discredit anyone who feels some type of way. I don't, I understand, you know, if you understand how long it takes a vaccine to come out, you do the math, that's, whoa. But the thing here is that we have so many different people working on this project, so many different people. We would not like, I, you have to think about it too. Pfizer is a huge company, although there's a lot of politics around it, understandably, but you know, we we want something that's going to help the people. Now, if you even think about it on a monetary basis, monetary basis, the more you help, the more it works, the more you buy money. That's just what it is. But aside, separate aside from that, just saving lives, we really value, um, Pfizer is built on a series of values and everything like that we want to help the people like we're here to help the people this is something that we want to do everyone who works at Pfizer we you know the mission statement you know what's you know what our mission is we all just really came together it took a lot of hard work and yes it came out very quickly but everyone came together we focused on the COVID vaccine we focused on helping trying to help those so many people were dying left and right. We all knew, we all saw it in the news, like people were really dying from this and no one really could understand what it is. Are we still in the understanding phase? Absolutely, because just as any disease, there's different variants, there's different mutations out there, there's different things going on. So we have a team that's focused on that. We have a team that's focused on getting, um, you know, I'm part of a smaller team that's part of a bigger team that's part of an even bigger team. We all just came together, different sites came together, Pfizer as a whole came together in order to produce this vaccine so quickly. And I think that it's 
I understand on one hand, but it's also disheartening on the other hand when people are really here with their conspiracy theories and and thinking that we're trying to put chips into people. And I've heard so many different things like um, where actually the the vaccine is inserting chips, the vaccine, um, we're all going to turn into zombies. I've heard, I, I heard the zombie one. I heard, I heard we got five years. You know, and um, I've heard it's just a conspiracy theory. I heard that we're just targeting the black community. That was the most shocking thing I've ever heard because I'm like, no, we're not going into black communities only telling you, hey, take the vaccine. This is a world thing. Like this is a global thing. We're not just going into the black communities now. If there's a little bit more emphasis on the black communities, it's because we understand that sometimes in a black community, you there is not a whole information is not widely provided. So what we're trying to do, or what some of us try to do, is to provide that information. And to be honest, a lot of these conspiracy theories come out because, unfortunately, the Black community is unaware of what's going on. They don't have the information that they need, and that's not necessarily their fault, but they don't have the information that they need to really make educated decisions as to taking the vaccine and not taking the vaccine. I think, I think, and Kevin, I don't know if this is what you was about to jump in on, um, but... I also think there's a history there though, right? Yes. That we can't yes. ignore. So, so I, I, similarly to you, right? Like I, I do, and, and I don't think you're saying like, I, I, you're a whole scientist, like, you know, the history, you, you do this work, right? But I, I think there, both of these things are combined, right? Where it's like, historically, people have literally tried to kill black and brown people, right? Like I'm, I'm Puerto Rican Salvadorian, like in Puerto Rico, there's a whole like study around is where people injected cancer in, in, into Right. Puerto Rican people, no. right? And so, like, so I think there's that piece, that component that we are we're so like used to hearing historically, and then the piece of also we don't we don't have the knowledge. So I definitely understand, and I guess that's where I was getting to is that I definitely understand that aspect of being scared as well, because as a, a big experiment, everyone knows this is he, the Tuskegee experiment that happened for black men. And that's a huge one. And people still to this day, like, will quote that and say, like, how can I sit here and believe this when this is what you guys did to us years back? And I definitely understand, actually, for one of my classes and my doctorate, I did why the Black community is, like, um, doesn't want to take a vaccine. It's definitely worded very differently, but I can't remember right now, but basically like why they don't. And I did, I, that was something I spoke about. The history behind it is that this is Kiki experiment. This is what they were feeling. This is what they were going through. Who this? Who is going to say, okay, no problem. I'm fine enough. And, to, and any vaccine that comes out, you do clinical trials, right? And during clinical trials, that is you basically trying to see, like see how it affects um, the people. And even with that, um, I will encourage anyone who wants to take the vaccine, anyone who's um, thinking about signing up for a clinical trial and stuff, really just do your research and do accurate research at that. If you're going to research something about Pfizer, please, there's more than enough information on the Pfizer site, on LinkedIn, on anything. Go to reliable resources. So, Lexi, that's actually what I was going to ask you about. Okay. So, one of the things that I, that I find is that a lot of people... Like I said, keep saying, oh, I did my research or I'm researching. But if you're not a scientist in that world, you might not necessarily know where to go to research. So, for example, if I want to learn more about Pfizer, right, um, obviously I can go to the Pfizer website, but the Pfizer website is going to be like, hey, th- th- take the vaccine, <laughs> right? So where, say, so where else, right? So what are some of the ways that is, people could research? A good source is really like the CDC website. They keep that very up to date, very... Um, because we have to report back to them. Everyone who has a vaccine right now has to report back to them and um, any adverse effects, anything that anyone may be feeling. I would definitely say the CDC. Um, and another good source, don't just go into the Google and just just go to Google and say like, hey, like, you know, whatever. You could go to Google Scholar. Google Scholar is different than Google. Google Scholar, these are published documents that have been, you know, read, uh, approved, everything like that. What's in them is factual. So we shouldn't go to Wikipedia and see what I is happening. I was just about to say that. When you go to Google, people will go to Google and they go to Wikipedia. Wik- I could write on Wikipedia. You could write on Wikipedia. The person looking up could write on Wikipedia. Anyone could go on Wikipedia. Please do not go on Wikipedia. Um, 
so those are different outlets, I definitely would say. The CDC is a good one. Um, I think um, NHBI, if, if I'm not saying that properly, but basically that acronym um, is a good source as well. Um, and um, Google Scholar, but a lot of like NHBI documents and um, papers and stuff are on Google Scholar. So you could add, um, access it through there as well. But those are different, different avenues, yes. But you know, for instance, I could, I could say it this way. Um, when you have a headache and your arm aches or something like that and you look it up on Google, it tells you you have cancer. That is not true. So at that point, it's like, you look at it that way. No. <laughs> so can you, can you talk about that a little bit more too? Like, cause this, this was going to be my next question was around side effects, right? Like after uh -huh. you get the vaccine, like why do people experience side effects? Okay. So some people will experience side effects and some people will not. In any commercial, if you guys have ever seen, and one, this is not even the first vaccine we've come out with, just putting that out there. There's many others. So you can even do research on the other ones that we put out as well. But um, any commercial you've heard, they zip through your side effects. That's one. So it's like nausea, heartburn, da da da, da That's all you hear. And then you hear like, may cause death. That's anything. That's a simple pill. An allergy pill can cause death depending on your underlying diseases that you may have. Or something that you may not be aware of. So at this point, yes, anyone can have adverse effects and it's stated there, any adverse effects that you may have. Now, sometimes um, I can I cannot speak for like everyone who has either passed away or if someone who has died due to the COVID vaccine, and I can't even say due to the COVID vaccine, anything can cause an adverse effect in your body, but sometimes we are unaware of what's even going on in our bodies. Some things that are going on in our bodies, we're unaware of because they're asymptomatic. We're walking around fine. Everything is fine. We do not know what's going on. So if you have an asymptomatic disease that's happening or something that's adverse happening within your system, you cannot report that to your doctor because you're not really sure, right? Like most of the time you go to the doctor because something is hurting, something is wrong. If you're not if you're not hurting or if you don't understand something is wrong, you're not reporting to your doctor or anything. So you now go ahead and take the vaccine, and any component of the vaccine can have an adverse effect on what's already going on in your body, and unfortunately that could cause the death or major issues. Now, like I said, when things are asymptomatic, they do not show. You cannot see them, and that's the kind of the scary part about anything that's asymptomatic that's going on in your body. That's why. Uh, we encourage or I encourage at least um, yearly checkups just to just to see what's going on in your body and stuff like that. Um, the body's very complex. There's many things that make up us as human beings. There's many different layers. So something that might be seen to, might not be seen to the naked eye. Like there's so many different things that could go wrong. So I definitely understand the concern and I understand what's happening, like what people may say, like, oh well, it may cause death, but that's like anything else. It's not the first thing that may cause death. Another thing that I, I've heard is that we might need booster shots. So I've heard people saying that like the, the vaccine is only going to be good for a certain amount of time. And then we're going to need yearly shots after that. Can so you speak actually, to that? Yes, I actually have a direct quote from our um, chairman and chief officer, chief executive officer. So I'm just going to read that in regards to that. Um, so. It says, together with BioNTech, which is who we partnered with for our vaccine, we have initiated an evaluation of a third dose of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Um, they're going to, you know, so yes. So to answer your question, that's why I just took that direct quote from him. I guess we are. Um, it has not um, been yet approved, I don't believe. Um, so we're still in the works of that. But if there is, um, this is because, okay, so I guess, you know, the flu vaccine, right? The flu vaccine, you take it every year because the flu, the different variations of the flu or variants of the flu change per year. So um, a couple of scientists <laughs> um, study that and decide, okay, these are the amount of variants that may come out for this year. So this is what we're going to produce in our flu vaccine. Now with COVID, because it's so new for us, we've been dealing with the flu for how many years, right? The COVID vaccine right now is very new. So 
or just COVID, the disease in general, like people are still studying this disease and there's different variants that come out. Diseases love to mutate. There's different mutations that are coming out and what the, all of the hand sanitizer and all of this and that, it's just like um, anything else, it finds a way to still come in. You, you see what I'm saying? So we'll find a way to still mutate itself to still, you know, get past certain barriers. Um, so with that being said, a booster shot, um, I guess without saying too much that I don't know about, right, because it's still kind of new, but I would think that the booster shot is because of the different variants that are coming out. So it's just trying to protect you against the next couple that may may come and try to attack because of the mutation that has occurred. So, so to that point, do we know, like, generally speaking, if you get the two recommended doses, let's say for uh, Pfizer, do we know how long um, that, that may be effective for? And I know we're still following clinical trials, if I, if I understand yes, correctly. Yes, we still are following clinical trials, so I can't, I don't have a definite answer. What I've seen, just like just everyone else, when it comes to clinical, I think it's saying six months. Um, but once again, we're still following the clinical trials because it can be more than six months. You know what I mean? Like it really just depends um, because with these, we still have to just keep testing and see like, okay, during this exposure, what's going on here? Just keep testing and testing and um, seeing depending on exposure, um, everything that's happening. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate your honesty in, in all of this, right? This this didn't feel like a like Pfizer propaganda. Like it felt it felt like it felt real. So so thank you for that. So yo, we are gonna close out. I I feel fulfilled. Uh, I'm I, I have the the COVID vaccine. I feel better now. I mean I had it already, so there's nothing I could have done about it. But I, but I feel better after this this conversation. So so thank you for kicking it with us. Uh, thank yeah. you for. Thank you for being a role model for the the next young lady who's up to bat, the next uh, the next kid from the Bronx who who's going to be a scientist. Thank you for being that. Um, even if you didn't know you were doing it, you are doing it. And and thank you for informing folks about the about the the Pfizer vaccine and about the vaccine in general. So, folks, if you're listening, if you're on the fence about the vaccine, do your research in a real way, like Alexi said, and make the choice that's best for you. Um, but also for those around you, right? For your parents, for your grandparents, all of that. And uh, and yo, that's that's all I have. Jay, you want to close on anything? Did I leave anything out? Just uh, just uh, Lexi, if people want to just stay up to date with you or follow you, follow oh, yes, the work yes, that you're yes, doing. Yes, mm-hmm. I was I was definitely have a line for that. Um, if you guys want to stay up to date with me, um, you could definitely just email me. Um, I check my email on a daily, um, and then we could go from there. My social media my LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn is like my name. So I guess if you just look me up, Alexi, A-L-E-X-I Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R. Um, I'll connect with you on there. Email is my saint, is Alexi, A-L-E-X-I dot Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R 219 at gmail.com. And um yeah, we'll leave it at that. Everything. <laughs> okay. You can follow uh, Live from the Bronx on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Live from the Bronx and on Twitter at Live from the BX. You can uh, check out our website at www.livefromthebronx.com or send us an email. Let us know what you think. Leave a review. Tell us who you want to see on this show. Uh, email us at info at Live from the Bronx.com. All right, we did it, y'all. See y'all next week.